24 different uh, sources on heaven when I decided to do my thesis on heaven. And while the viewpoints I give are, of course, biased by those readings, like I said, I read 24 different books, and I'll give you the uh, bibliography at the end of this course, so you can also go to those books and read some of them. Uh, there's authors, I'll, I'll admit to you right away, there's authors that I read on, on a, this topic, Heaven, who took very much license, and there's a lot of surmising. Uh, most of them try to back it up with scripture. I hope what I've done is taken all of those references, combined them, and filtered them with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And then they became my viewpoints when I wrote my thesis. Now, I don't expect every viewpoint I give you to be 100% accurate, but I did my best. Um, last week, the topic of the Great White Throne Judgment came up. And so I produced a uh, two-page sort of uh, scriptural based as to why I stand on the, that. That, that we will be present with the Lord at the great white throne. And it'll be a situation like he's the judge and we're the jury. We're standing there behind him saying amen and amen and supporting everything he says. You know, I picture the great white throne like this. Here's what I want to do. Establish that, first off, we've come to the end of the millennial reign. At the end of the millennial reign, we know that God is going to destroy the earth. In fact, we gave you a reference in Peter where it said that the very elements would be melted. And so what I picture is, is uh, God removing us from the earth. And at that great white throne, we would stand behind Jesus. He would then resurrect the bodies of the dead who were lost. They're without Christ. And then all of the souls that rejected Christ from eternity past would stand in front of the great white throne. And then Jesus would judge every one of them from the books. And we talked about those books a little bit several weeks ago. And so everything, every thought, every deed, everything they did for, each, for their lifetime would be displayed for all to see. The hidden things, the Bible says. And Paul tells us in Corinthians, know you not that you shall judge the world? So we are not only kings and priests during the millennial reign, but we stand with Jesus um, at the great white throne. The other thing that I'd mention is that at the rapture, and we'll be covering this today in detail, that's what our message today is about. After the rapture, one of the things we're told is that we shall be forever with the Lord. So from that point on, after your, you receive your new bodies and go to the present heaven, you will never have a time when the Lord won't be present, that you won't be present with the Lord. That's good news, isn't it? In fact, when you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that at our death, because we're saved, we're going to spend the rest of eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with no further ado, oh, also, if you would like that two-page kind of overview of the great white throne and the, all the scripture references that I base what I just told you on, uh, give me a little piece of paper with your email on it, okay? And then what I can do is email that to you because I can't spend any more time on that. And we'll be covering it more when we get into the millennial reign. Okay, heaven, lesson six. The day of the Lord and the pre-tribulation rapture of the church explain. That's what I call it. And I explain the independent Baptist viewpoint on it. And I believe we're right, obviously, or I wouldn't give it to you. I believe that our basis for a pre-tribulation rapture is scripture-based. And I believe all the other viewpoints you hear, mid-trib, post-trib, rapture, are wrong, obviously, or I wouldn't teach it the way I'm teaching it. So let's get started. In my introduction, I bring up that I've called this sort of the second phase of our eternity. Remember, phase one is when to die is to be present with the Lord. You go to the present heaven. But you go there without your new bodies. 
Phase two, I've sort of called the, the phase where after the rapture, we receive our new bodies, we go back to the present heaven. Phase three of our study will be the millennial reign. We'll talk about that soon. And then phase four of our eternity is the ultimate eternal destiny where we'll spend eternity on the new earth. So anyway, I'll give scriptural evidence of the pre-trib rapture of the church and the church's presence in heaven during the seven-year tribulation. After the rapture of the church, we'll return to the present heaven, like I just said. The church is not mentioned after chapter 3 in the book of Revelation. That's another reason that um, we believe in a pre-trib rapture. Therefore, the church is not on the earth during that tribulation. However, the saints are mentioned several times in the book of Revelation, and we've mentioned some of those, haven't we? We've read where they're celebrating in heaven. We read chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 9, and we gave you examples of how that we're rejoicing and praying in the, in the present heaven. So there is strong biblical support that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. And I put some references at the end of my uh, uh, introduction here. Uh, the last sentence, the scriptures plainly teach that God did not save the believer for the wrath to come. And you can look those up. I hope you will. Before I begin this lesson, as part of my intro, we will need to understand the term the day of the Lord or that day as used in the scripture. Um, the term is strongly related to God's rule on the earth, his special interventions into the course of world events to judge the enemy, his enemies, to accomplish his purpose for history, and thereby demonstrate who he is, followed by a time of God's blessing and rule. It has a twofold nature. One, it is used to demonstrate the outpouring of God's wrath upon a rebellious world. Please look these references up. This outline is seven pages, and <laughs> I only have time to do three or four for 45-minute message. So I have to skip a lot of the looking up. I'm counting on you guys to look these up. So it's used to demonstrate the outpouring of God's wrath upon the rebellious world. It's also used to characterize divine light and blessing and the administration of God's rule. Note, therefore, the day of the Lord in the future has a twofold nature of both the outpouring of God's wrath and the blessings accompanied by God's rules. By the way, most scholars recognize this and teach it as such. Um, I wasn't able to find too many that didn't. The tribulation, which is God's wrath, right? It's also known, the tribulation period is also known as a time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to talk about that a little later. But it is a time of God's wrath on a rebellious world, a, a God-rejecting world. And then the millennium is the God's blessing and reign. So the day of the Lord or that day, a lot of times as you read the references I gave you in the Old Testament, you'll find that they're talking about not one single day, but a, a broad period of time in the broad sense. Now you will see it in Scripture in the narrow sense at certain times, such as in, in the book of Joel, you'll see the second coming referred to as that great and terrible day of the Lord. And in that sense, it's narrow, and it's talking about the day he returns and destroys the armies that, that go against Israel. So uh, you'll see it used in the broad sense most of the time. Okay, underneath that topic one, scriptural examples of the use of the term day of the Lord, or that day describing past events. Uh, the, the first one, Amos 5.18, where he raised up the nation of Assyria to judge the northern kingdom, and then Lamentations 1.12, and the rest of them, where he used Babylon to judge the southern kingdom. So you look those up, please. It, it, it all referred to the day of the Lord. And you, what you'll notice is, it, again, it's not a singular day when they're talking about that day. It's talking about the entire spectrum of God's wrath in the tribulation. Scriptural examples of the use of the term day of the Lord in the future. Look those up. Um, the one that we'll be talking about today is D, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. We're going to go through that one in detail. Okay, So please look those up because they all deal with the day of the Lord, which is very important. Paul refers to it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which we're going to be studying today. Okay. So there's my intro. I hope you'll look up those verses, get a good understanding 
of what the day of the Lord, what that's all about, how it's used. Um, hopefully those examples and scripture references I gave you will help you. Okay, topic number one, the rapture or snatching up of the church. This would be the end of the age that we're in now. Uh, what's another term for the church age that we're in now? The age of Christ, what else? Age of grace, dispensation of grace. Any others? Yep, that's it. So we're going to talk about that rapture and snatching up and the end of this age and how the day of the Lord then comes. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 is our reference. If you want, you can follow along in your Bible. I kind of do, even when there's an outline, because I like to get the context of what's around it. So if you want, you can open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 13. But I would have, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Notice that Jesus has brought the souls of those that are in the present heaven with him when he comes to meet us in the air. Now, when you get your new bodies, let's, let's say you're to die tomorrow. I hope you don't, but let's say you do. And you go to the present heaven and the rapture is tomorrow. You'll, your soul, your spirit will come down with the Lord in the air and your new body will meet you in the air with Jesus. The next event that happens is found in verse 15 through 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall ever be with the Lord. And that's, that particular reference is so comforting to me because I really like the idea that when we go to the present heaven, so we shall ever be with the Lord. We will never be out of his presence ever again in eternity. That's always nice to know. Also note that we meet him in the air. Jesus does not touch down on the earth yet. Um, this will only happen after the ending uh, the, and during half or all the day. Think about it. Why would someone say this is comforting? Why would Paul say this is comforting and then turn around and say, oh, by the way, you're going to have to live through all seven years of that horrible tribulation period. Would that be comforting to you? If I were to tell you, okay, you know what, uh, we're going to be raptured, we're going to be taken up, but uh, you're going to have to endure the seven-year tribulation if you're here during that time. That wouldn't be too comforting. And as you'll see as we study in chapter 5 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 3 in the, in the rest of this lesson, you'll see that we are not prepared for wrath, for God's wrath. So, of, of course, it wouldn't be comforting if Paul said that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's pick it up there, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, I hope you read uh, John R. Rice's uh, sermon on this. How many of you had a chance to read that? Let's see if you did. Okay. Basically, in his sermon... He tells you the same thing that I tell you in point D. So if you look at point D, we'll just read it together. The day of the Lord, that is God's wrath, plus his time of rule, that would be the tribulation and then the thousand year reign, is going to come on them as a thief in the night. This means that the day of the Lord is imminent. It could happen at any time. Now, for those who believe in a mid-trib uh, rapture, here's where the problem lies. If you believe that, then you'll know as soon as the treaty is signed that there's three and a half years before the middle of the trip. And you'll also know from Scripture that exactly three and a half years after that, that would be the full 70th week of Daniel 9.27, you'll know exactly three and a half years from that point in time that the second coming will come. That's not a thief in the night. That's not a surprise. 
So that's another reason we hold to a pre-trib rapture. The tribulation uh, uh, is going to come as a thief in the night. We do not know the day of our rapture and the subsequent day of the Lord. So if you're a mid-trib believer, the rapture would not come as a surprise. Continue on in, with verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now look at that word, they shall not escape. Who is not going to escape what's coming, the coming destruction? The unbeliever, right? They're not going to escape, but we are. Stay tuned. Here's, here's the way it goes. After the rapture, people are going to think that this leader, this, this beast, this uh, antichrist, has all the answers. Because God is going to send strong delusion. And they're going to believe a lie. They've already rejected the gospel. We've been raptured up. And now they believe a lie. And they're all going to say peace. Hey, we finally have a peace treaty with the Middle East. We've been, they've been trying for many years, haven't they? And they're going to be celebrating. But the Bible here says, then sudden destruction will come upon them. In the Bible, birth pangs are associated with God's purposed judgment, wrath, and fierce anger against the wicked. And I put some Old Testament examples for you. Um, Job 21, 17, Isaiah 26. Isaiah uh, 13, 6 through 8 describes the day of the Lord. Let's look at that one. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 13. Uh, verses 6 through 8. Isaiah chapter 13. Starting with verse 6, it says, How ye for how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. So there's that the day of the Lord. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Here it is, pangs and sorrows. So there's the birth pangs. Um, in the New Testament, they use a different word, but the Greek word for it is the same. The same meaning, pangs and sorrows, or birth pangs. Shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So there's coming a day, the day of the Lord described here in Isaiah, where you're going to have many sorrows. Now, Jesus, in Matthew 24, describes those beginnings of sorrows in the first, uh, well, in verses 4 through 9 of chapter 24. Jesus describes the beginnings of sorrows. What he's describing in Matthew 24 is a basic outline of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 through 19. So, I, I hope you'll look those up and you'll study each one of those. Also, I gave you some New Testament examples, and one of them is what I just spoke of, the Matthew 24 example. And I've given you the verses in Matthew 24, and I've given you the comparison in the book of Revelation to show you the parallels between Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. Let me tell you that in Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus describes the mid-trib point where the Antichrist sets himself up as God. And he, that's called the, the desecration of the temple, that, that, par, that part in Daniel 9, 27. So the parallels are there. I hope you'll look them up. It describes the day of the Lord, which is a judgment time upon the earth. Now what you're going to notice as we study further in, in the book of Thessalonians, you're going to notice that Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit and the church are going to be removed before the day of the Lord. So I've just defined for you what the day of the Lord is. It's the coming wrath of God on this earth. And then the subsequent rule and blessing for his people. 
the day of the Lord, the broad sense. We are going to be raptured out of here, good news, before that day of the Lord. Let's study further. Point F. Actually, let's read the note above point F. Both the Bible and ancient Judaism teach that the last seven years before the Messiah comes to reign over the earth will be characterized by severe birth pangs. You know, and I've had people say to me, well, you know, there's always been earthquakes, you know, what? and they try to belittle the time we're in. And, and even some have said we might even be in the uh, tribulation period. Have you ever run across people who do that? Well, you know, if you read that first uh, part of the tribulation in Reve Revelation chapter 6, you'll find that all of the mountains are moved during this earthquake on the earth. All of the I islands are fled away, the Bible says. So this isn't your average earthquake. It's a worldwide shaking that destroys all the mountains of the world. We haven't seen that yet, have we? So anyway... Paul's explanation in point F, during the day of the Lord in our context, this is what he's talking about. At the signing of the peace treaty with the Antichrist, the world will be saying, peace in the Middle East, finally. Instead, there will be sudden destruction. And we've just talked about Isaiah uh, 13, 6 through 9. And notice the words again, point one under this one, they shall not escape. Notice it says, they shall not escape and not us. Paul didn't say, we will not escape, did he? He didn't, he didn't write, we will not escape this terrible event. He wrote, they shall not escape. And then he goes on to explain who the they is in the Bible. They are the unsaved. They are the ones that denied the truth that kept them from salvation. Let's read. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, that's where we're at. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Okay, he's just said it'll come as a thief in the night, the day of the Lord, right? That judgment time that's going to come on the earth is going to come as a thief in the night. But what does he say here? But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Look at the next verse. This is the one I like. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now, he's just said that the day of the Lord is not going to come upon you as a thief. That's good news. And now he's, he's saying that he's not appointed us unto wrath. So again, it redefines what we're saying. The day of the Lord in the Bible, the way it's used in Scripture, is always a period of time of wrath, God's wrath or judgment, followed by a time of blessing. And we're going to see that in this world when it comes to the tribulation and then the subsequent thousand-year reign. So that's the day of the Lord. And he says that this day will not come upon you as a thief in the night, and the other good news is we're going to see later on the timing of this event is that we're taken up and the Holy Spirit is taken out of here before the day of the Lord. Bear with me. Hang in there. We're getting there. So we're not appointed to wrath, but what does it say here in verse 9? To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus. So he not only saved us eternally when we were born again, way back then when you accepted Christ, but he saved you from his wrath his wrath for eternity. None of us are going to see the second death. That's good news. But he's also saved us from the wrath that's going to come upon this earth, the seven-year tribulation. Notice in verse 4 through 9, Paul is saying to the church that since we're not in darkness, we do not have to worry about being overtaken by this day as a thief. We're saved. We're children of the light. We have the hope of salvation or the expectation of better things. In verse 9, then he makes it plain. In the context of the chapter, which is about the day of the Lord, that we're not appointed unto that wrath. You're not going to see it. Verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We're going to be with Jesus for eternity. Once we die, go to the present heaven, we'll never part from him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you do also. Okay, so now we've showed you 
What most of us already, I'm expecting, knew, we knew that the we knew that scripture like the back of our hand. First Thessalonians 4, 8 through 13. 8 through 18. Or 13 through 18, I'm sorry. Most of us know it really well. We've studied it many times. So we know how the rapture is going to occur. Now we're going to talk about the timing of those events. Like I said, there's a lot of debate on it, even in Christian circles. Some say, well, no, it's a mid-trib rapture. No, it's a post-trib. We Baptists believe it's a pre-trib. And I'm going to show you why when we get into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, if you want, you can open your Bible to that or just follow the outline along because I have the verses in here. So the order of these events, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. So somebody's writing letters and claiming to be Paul, I guess confusing them, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So somebody's writing them and saying, hey, just like you see today, you, you get some magazine articles. We're in the tribulation. I remember during the Gulf War when the, the oil wells were spewing smoke and fire and it darkened the moon. People were saying, yeah, that's it. We're, we're in the tribulation time. No. Anyway, they're doing the same thing here. The day of Christ is at hand. Paul has found that many had been misled by letters from some that pretend to be him. It said, as from him. Notice it says, as from us. If you look at 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3.11, some had even quit working, and I put the verse there for you. So, people had been so misled by letters from some other source other than Paul that they had even quit working. Well, you know, the day of the Lord's at hand, might as well just uh, get, get our stuff in order, get ready. But he's got to correct this situation. So follow with me in verse 3. He's saying, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. There's the term in quotes, that day, or the day of the Lord, which is what we've been talking about, right? In the broad sense, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, I really believe that the great falling away is happening right before our eyes. There are many Christians, born-again Christians, that just don't put church as a priority in their life. They, be, they become very carnal. They're more concerned with worldly affairs. They're born again, they're believers, but they've fallen away from the faith or the practice of our faith. We're there, that's already happened. But this next part hasn't happened. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist has not been revealed. Remember what I said in the introduction. That day has a broad sense and a narrow sense. Two things have to happen before that day, before the tribulation starts in the broad sense. A falling away of Christians from the faith and the Antichrist being revealed. Let's go into verse 4 now. Look what it says. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. Now, here's the uh, picture of the Antichrist that Paul is painting for us. Look what he says. He's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be that he is God. Now, if you compare this to Daniel 9.27, and Matthew 24, verse 15, the comparisons I've been making throughout this study, you'll find that this is what Paul's describing. In fact, uh, you don't have to go there in your Bibles. I have it written right here in the outline. Look at Revelation 13, 4 through 9. It's described during the tribulation, the character of the Antichrist. Let's read together. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast, the dragon being Satan, right? gave power to the beast, the Antichrist, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now look at this. Forty and two months, three and a half years left. 
So for the last three and a half years of the tribulation, not only is he going to break the treaty with Israel, he's going to desecrate the temple by setting himself up as God. He'll stop the uh, oblations, no more sacrifices, and uh, that is when the 144,000 Jews come to Christ. They realize from prophecy and Daniel 9:27 and many others that they have killed their Messiah. And so we have three and a half years. Of, but look, what he, look at the character of this Antichrist. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over him all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book, uh, the book of the, <laughs> excuse me, written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So we have the mid-trib point where the Antichrist sets himself up as God. Again, that's found in, in uh, Daniel 9.27, and it's found in uh, uh, Matthew 24.15, the same event. And that's what Paul's talking about. Then in verse 5, Paul goes on to say, remember, now he's, look what he's saying in verse 5. Remember not, when I was with you, I told you these things? He's saying, hey, why are you so confused? How could this letter from someone else have you thinking we're in the day of the Lord? How did this happen? And I always ask people that when you get, and you'll, you'll see, there was even a TV preacher one time, I was flipping through the channels, and he was teaching that we're in the tribulation period. And that was one of my thoughts. How could he get that? It's plain from the scripture and what Paul is teaching, what, what those events are. Now look at verse 6. Here's where he's going to explain it. And now you know what withholdeth. Now you know. Now that I've told you, now that I've pointed this out to you, you know what's stopping this from happening. You know what's withholding the day of the Lord from coming. Look what he says. That he might be revealed in his time. In other words, he hasn't been revealed yet, and you know what's keeping that from happening. Look at verse 7. The mystery of iniquity already works. Only he who now letteth, now that word letteth comes from the Greek word kateko, which simply means withhold, or if you will, a restraining force. So let's read that verse again with that in mind. For the mystery of iniquity, that is the Antichrist, is going to come, doth already work. Man, can we see that in our world today? I can say the, the workings of the Antichrist are definitely working here in this world. That was true then, that's true now. Only he who now letteth or prevents this from happening, that it would be the Holy Spirit, will let or will prevent or will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So in other words, Paul is saying, look, I don't know who's telling you this, but there's a restraining force with us now during this church age, and that's the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit's going to prevent that from happening. Our influence, folks, keeps a lot of things that the world would like to see happen from happening. I think they'll celebrate when we're gone, when we're raptured. Then they'll get their way. Then look at verse 7, which we already covered. One more time. Until what? Until he be taken out of the way. So until the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way, the day of the Lord can't come. Now, if the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way, what does that tell you about us? We're gone. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and the Holy Spirit's ministry in the world is to convict the world of sin. So he'll be taken out of the way, along with us. No more influence of the Holy Spirit. God sends strong delusion. So now there won't be any thought about us, and they'll believe a lie from, from the Antichrist. They'll take it bait, hook, and sinker. They're going to love it. His peace treaty, they won't have a clue about the Bible. We'll be gone. Look at point A under that verse. Remember what that word means. It means restrain. He who now letteth. Paul is saying that once the Holy Spirit, who's preventing the Antichrist, is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will appear on the scene. Now, I believe, 
and we don't have to read this next part, uh, I'll just kind of give you a summary. I believe there's a gap between the time of the rapture and the time the Antichrist is revealed. And the reason I do is because, um, first off, you have to establish a treaty. Uh, God sends strong delusion and confusion. I believe also there will be many people saved that were listening to us somewhat. They didn't receive the gospel, but they know of the time coming that we talked about, the tribulation, the time of the rapture, and they'll see that and they'll believe. But it's going to be a lot different from them. for them. The Holy Spirit's not going to be here. So they will have to endure to the end with their faith. And that might mean even being beheaded or imprisoned for not taking the mark of the beast. So it's not a time you want to be alive. I always tell people that say, well, you know, Mike, if you're right, you know, and that happens, uh, they'll get saved then. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be around during that seven-year period. And I give them some examples of the things that are going to happen. And God's going to send such confusion and delusion am amongst the people that the odds are no one's going to, very few are going to come to Christ. But it's always been that way, right? Narrow is the way to eternal life. Broad is the way to destruction. It's always been that way. So there's only going to be a remnant that listened to us and endure to the end during the tribulation. So let's look at some questions here about what we've covered so far. What is the mystery of iniquity at work today that Paul is speaking of in verse 7? And we've talked about that. It's the spirit of the Antichrist, isn't it? And it's already at work in the world. We can see a lot of the things coming to fruition from his work, too. We're becoming a cashless society. We now have the ability to tie all the computers networked throughout the world to a one-world banking system. A lot of the things that we know we have to see in the tribulation period are forming. We see, we see Iran, Russia, Germany, and uh, Turkey, which is two ball, coming together. You know, that's the Ezekiel 39 war right there. That's the war that's the Armageddon, that's described as the Armageddon. Anyway, so we see it at work today. Uh, question two, what is the restraining or withholding force keeping total chaos from breaking loose and the Antichrist being revealed? The Holy Spirit, right? He's the preventing force. According to verse 7, what must happen before the Antichrist is revealed and total chaos breaks loose. He that letteth or restrains must be removed. According to the next verse, what happens after the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way? Then the Antichrist is revealed. So the restraining force that's keeping the Antichrist from being revealed and the day of the Lord from being ushered in is the Holy Spirit. Let's read verses 8 through 10 now in 2 Thessalonians. And then that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This event is described in Revelation 19.21. Again, I hope you'll uh, look these up. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not... Look at... Here's the explanation. Here's why they are going to see the destruction of the Antichrist. Look at it. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. How many times do you suppose they've been witness to? God always gives us many opportunities to come to Him, doesn't He? I know with me, He gave me many opportunities from several Christian witnesses throughout my life before I came to Christ. They're going to be without excuse. They're going to suffer the entire seven-year tribulation because they would not come to the love of the truth that they might be saved. Then in Revelation 13, 13 through 16, let's read that together. These are some of the uh, Antichrist lying wonders. And he that doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had led to power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or foreheads. You know, in our grandparents' day and age, this would be impossible. Look at it and say, well, how, how in the world are we going to get everybody to go along with one banking system and a one world system? And yet now we have system manager computers that can manage entire cities and access to gates and doors. I work for Boeing in Seattle, and there's hundreds of buildings throughout the Seattle area that belong to Boeing. And from one central computer and your chip, the chip that you carry with you at all times, they can give you access to the doors that you have permission to. And uh, they also have one that I went through. It had a a retina scan and a palm scan. And I thought, you know, it kind of looks like your forehead's being scanned here. It, in a way, it does. The mark on your forehead, the mark on your wrist. And I was thinking about how that one central computer controls everywhere I have access to. I could go to any one of the cafeterias, and only if I had the chip programmed right could I buy food at those cafeterias. So, you know, I, I thought about that. I thought, man, you know, this is kind of like a trial run of the mark. Now all they have to do is put something, you know, some kind of chip on you and, and they could, you know, hold your medical records and things like that. No more th identity theft, no more problems with that. So anyway, I hope you'll be able to read the rest of this and uh, understand that this was an important lesson for me to continue with our study next week on the millennial reign. And it, it's very important that we understand why we believe in a pre-trib rapture. And we are able to articulate the verses that I just gave you. Um, I hope you'll read the summary. I don't have time. Um, but, um, and look up all the verses that I gave throughout this study. They're very important. The big thing is to understand that the day of the Lord, is in, at least in this subject in 1st Thessalonians 4 and 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 is used in the broad sense of the term and it describes the period of time of God's wrath that's going to come upon the earth known as the tribulation or a time of Jacob's trouble the reason they call I'm sure the reason in the Old Testament it's referred to as a time of Jacob's trouble is because God is dealing with the Jews with his people during the tribulation the fact that they rejected their Messiah. Anyway, I hope this helps. And uh, I know as I studied it the third and fourth time, it, it reiterated to me that there are scriptural basis for why we as Baptists believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you that when we got saved, we were not only saved for eternity, but we were saved from your wrath that's going to come upon this earth. I thank you so much for it, for what you did in Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we study the millennial reign, we'll rejoice in the fact that we're going to rule and reign as kings and priests with you, and that we'll rejoice in that and, and love you all the more and understand you all the more as we study. We ask this in Jesus' name.